conjunction and partnership with Maine Coast Bookshop and Skidunkle Library, and our sponsor is the First Bank, and we're very <coughs> thankful for that. A couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this morning, and it is a new system, so if you are moved to jump up for a moment and scream, pull it back, okay? <laughs> that's not what we're looking for today. In addition, Nicole from Main Coast Bookshop is selling books, and Jenny will be signing after her talk this morning. So let's get going. First things first, our next chat is September 5th, and that will be Allison Reiser. And her recent book is The Case of the Green Turtle. It tells the story of how the green sea turtle, once the most popular seafood species in the world, because of the population of green turtle soup, was saved from extinction and the role that scientists played in defeating plants for farming green turtles for food. Talk about something a little bit different. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very fortunate this morning to be able to introduce our author. Jennifer Finley Boylan is the author of 12 books, including She's Not There, a groundbreaking and critically acclaimed bestseller, a regular contributor to the New York Times, op-ed page, and Connie Nez Traveler, Jennifer's appearance on the Today Show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, a Barbara Walters special, NPR's Talk of the Nation, Marketplace, and now Skidumpa. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. Demonstrate her charm and charisma. Jennifer now brings us through a thoughtful, tear-jerking, hilarious memoir stuck in the middle with you. Jennifer Boylan is a professor of English at Colby College. She has served on the judging committees of the Fulbright Scholar Program, which is administered by the U.S. Department of State. Jennifer, uh, Jennifer is on the board of directors of GLAD, serving as secretary to the executive committee. Is a member of the board of trustees of the Kinsey Institute of Research on Sex, Gender, and Reproduction. <coughs> and serves on the Policy Advisory Board of Gender Rights, Maryland. She and her family live in rural Maine. Please welcome Jen. Hi, everybody. Hi. I'm, I'm so glad you're here. And I, I really just cut it right down on the last second. There's construction coming down. Uh, uh, um, Route 27 from, from Augusta. So it was very dramatic. <laughs> I have, you know, those, those guys with the stop signs who just, you know, appear like he could sit, stand there all day with that sign. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go! <laughs> well, anyway, it is a great pleasure to speak with you today, and you're all very welcome. Uh, thank you for coming out today. I also want to thank um, everyone who runs this program at Skidonfa. Um, not just for what they do to make it possible for me to speak to you, but for all the authors who come. Uh, and uh, it is, um, their dedication keeps the torch of literature and literacy um, going um, in this community. And uh, as an author, I'm very, very grateful. So thank you very much. Um, I thought I would read you, um, I think I'm going to read two short things for you, um, uh, or maybe just one. It depends on, on what you're in the mood to do. It may be that you wish to have a conversation and, um, and, and talk a little bit, because issues of gender, uh, they seem to connect to everything, don't they? So um, I, will, I think I'll, I'll, I'll read you just, um, I'll try to maybe read some short things and then, and then maybe answer some of your questions. Um, it's funny, whenever I do events like this, I have to think back to an event I did um, on Martha's Vineyard now some years ago, I guess. Uh, but I was giving a, I was doing a signing at a bookstore um, uh, on Martha's Vineyard, uh, and it was on a Sunday afternoon. It was a beautiful day, and uh, um, we spent the morning uh, riding our bicycles uh, along the along the coast, and uh, showed up at uh, four o'clock, which was when the, the reading was uh, at the bookstore where where I didn't scheduled to speak. And as some of you know, um, the vineyard is small. There are only two bookstores on the vineyard. So I showed up there and, and uh, <clears throat> wouldn't you know, there's the owner of the bookstore with this kind of uh, melancholy expression. And I said, well, what, what could, be, could be wrong? And she said, well, Jenny, wouldn't you know, they scheduled another reading at the last second at the only other bookstore on Martha's Vineyard at this exact same hour. And, of course, and my first thought, of course, was, you know, Who's going to go to that when they can come see me? 
<laughs> and she said, well, it is Hillary Clinton. <laughs> Well, um, I guess the only people who are going to come to my reading are going to be transsexuals and, and Republicans. <laughs> which, which then made me think, well, is there such a thing as a, as a, as a transsexual Republican? And then I realized, yeah, sure, it's someone who thinks a little too much about their private sector. <laughs>
I've never said the word transgender out loud. I couldn't imagine saying it. I mean, come on, please. So instead, one day, a few years after I got out of college, I loaded all my things into the Volkswagen and started driving. I wasn't sure where I was going, but I knew I wanted to get away from the Maryland Spring with its cherry blossoms and its bursting tulips and all of its bullshit. <laughs> I figured I'd keep driving farther and farther north until there weren't any people. I wasn't sure what I was going to do then, but it, I was certain that something would occur to me that would end this transgender business once and for all. I set my sights on Nova Scotia. I drove to Maine and took a ferry out of Bar Harbor, back in the days when you could do that. I drove onto the SS Blue Nose and stood on the deck and watched America drift away behind me, which as far as I was concerned, was just fine. There was someone walking around in a rabbit costume <coughs> on the ship. He posed with you, and they'd snap your picture, and an hour or so later, you could purchase the photo of yourself with the rabbit as a memento of your trip to North Scotia. <laughs> I purchased mine. <laughs> it showed a sad-looking boy, I think that's a boy, with long hair, reading a book of poetry as a long-looking rabbit bends over him. In Nova Scotia, I drove the car east and north for a few days. When dusk came, I'd eat in a diner, and then I'd sleep either in the car or in a small tent I had in the back. There were scattered patches of snow up there, even in Maine. I kept going north until I got to Cape Breton, which is about as far away as you can get from Baltimore and still beyond dry land. In Cape Breton, I hiked around the cliffs, looked at the ocean. At night, I lay in my sleeping bag by the sea as breezes shook the tent. I wrote in my journal, or read the poetry of Robert Frost, or grazed around in the modern libraries great tales of horror and the supernatural. I read one up there called, Oh, Whistle, and I'll Come to You, My Lad. In the car, I listened to the warlock sing in the early morning rain on the tape deck. which is a song that goes <clears throat> In the early morning rain With a dollar in my hand And an aching in my heart And my pockets full of sand I'm a long way from home And I miss my loved ones so in the early morning rain, with no place to go. I thought about this girl I knew, Dee Dee Finney. I thought about my parents. I thought about the clear, inescapable fact that I was female in spirit, and how, in order to be whole, I'd have to give up on every dream I'd ever had, except one. I stayed in a motel one night that was officially closed for the season, but which the operator let me stay in for half price. I opened my suitcase and put on my bra and some jeans and a blue knit, blue knit top. I combed my hair out and looked in the mirror and saw a perfectly normal looking young woman. This is so wrong, I said to myself in the mirror. This is the cause of all the trouble I thought about settling in one of the little villages around there, just starting life over again as a woman. I could tell everyone I was Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> and I lay on my back and sobbed. Nobody would ever believe I was Canadian. <laughs> the next morning, I climbed the mountain at the far northern edge of Cape Breton Island. Climbed up to the top, trying to clear my head, but it wouldn't clear. I kept going up and up, past the tree line, past the shrub line, until at last there was just moss. And there I stood, looking out at the cold ocean a thousand miles below me, totally cut off from the world. A fierce wind blew in from the Atlantic. I leaned into it. I saw the waves crashing against the cliff below. I stood right at the edge. My heart pounded. 
I leaned over the edge of the precipice, but the gale blowing into my body kept me from falling. When the wind died down, I'd start to fall. Then it would blow me back up again. I'd play a little game with the wind, leaning a little further over the edge each time. And then I leaned off the edge at a sharp angle, my arms held outward like wings, my body sustained only by the fierce wind, and I thought, well, is this what she came here to do then? Let's do it then. And then, a huge blast of wind blew me backwards, and I landed on the moss. It was soft. I stared straight up at the blue sky, and I felt a presence. Are you all right? said the voice. You're going to be all right. You're going to be all right. Looking back now, I'm still not sure whose voice that was. My guardian angel? The ghost of my father? I don't know. Does it really change things all that much to give a name to the spirits that are watching out for us? Still, from this vantage point, over 25 years later, my heart tells me that that was the voice of my future self. The woman that I eventually became, a woman who, all these years later, looks more or less like the one I saw in the mirror in the motel. Looking back on that sad young man, I want to tell him it will get better. It will not always hurt the way it hurts now. The thing that right now you feel is your greatest curse will someday, against all odds, turn out to be, to be your greatest gift. It is hard to be gay or lesbian. To be trans can be even harder. There have been plenty of times when I've lost hope. But in the years since I heard that voice saying, you're going to be all right, I found, to my surprise, <clears throat> most people have treated me with love. Some of the people I most expected to lose when I came out as transgender turned out to be loving and compassionate and kind. I can't tell you how to get here from there. You have to figure that out for yourself. But I do know that instead of going off that cliff, I walked back down the mountain that morning and instead began the long, long journey toward home. Thanks. Complicated 
uh, figure. And whether one sees her as a hero or as a villain probably has as much to do with your politics, your feeling about um, the Iraq war, um, your feelings about government secrets, and, and yet, um, at the same time, uh, it's impossible to imagine um, the, the same kind of reaction coming if Manning had announced that she was gay, right? Um, if, if, if someone was being sentenced and, and, and sent off to Leavenworth, um, uh, said, and by the way, I'm gay. Oh, everyone, oh, I'm sorry, just nod it off for a second, because we've, in the last, what, 15, 20 years, um, we've really begun to um, uh, include uh, gay and lesbian discourse and identity as uh, among the ways we consider um, being human in this country. Being transgender is, is not like that yet, and it's still considered shocking. And in fact, on the news, it was possible for um, people who know nothing about this condition to denounce it, to say that, um, you know, well, anyway, let's move away from Manning for a second. What I want to leave you with just um, at the end of this much less entertaining monologue than the story of the <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, is, is this, which is a sense of what, when we say the word transgender, what does that even mean? The reason that people struggle with that word is that transgender is a so-called umbrella term which includes lots of different ways of being gender variant. There's a phrase for you, gender variant. It always, it always reminds me of um, Yosemite Sam saying, <laughs> saying gender varmint. <laughs> variant. Um, so, in other words, there's, it, transgender doesn't mean any one thing. Transgender can mean a bunch of different things, and I want to say real quickly three or four of the different things that it can mean. So, transgender includes, one kind of being transgender is a transsexual. That's me. Transsexuals come in two flavors, M to F and F to M. Um, people who begin their lives as men who have a sense, well, Back up. So a transsexual is someone who has a lifelong sense of him or herself as belonging physically to um, the sex other than the one they were born into. And there's very good evidence, both medical, well, medical and neurological, uh, that suggests that this is this really is a physical condition that you were born with. It is. It is. Um, uh, excuse me. Um, boom. We can. Um, uh, the truth. No, the truth does that to me. Um, in, in, to be specific, it has to do with the structure in the hypothalamus. If you want to talk dirty, it's the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis of the hypothalamus, <laughs> which is pretty good for English teacher, right? <laughs> which is the seat of the endocrine system in the body, which is where hormones are regulated. And there seems to be some evidence that this structure. Um, takes on a different shape in about the sixth week of pregnancy um, uh, in, in, in when the, the fetus is, is still in utero. So if you're a person like me, born with a Y chromosome, you have nonetheless this structure in your brain, uh, which we associate with, with, um, with women. So what is it like to grow up with that structure in your brain? Weird. It's, and and it, it's very hard to put your finger on it, but it is a, a, a completely, um, there is a sense of yourself not being wired correctly to your own body, to the body that you're in. And if that sounds really weird to you, you're right. It is weird. But because it's weird, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean it's not real. And it doesn't mean that if someone has the sense of themselves that they're crazy, it means that they are different from you. And that what we should be in the business of in this country is be in the business of embracing people who are different from ourselves, including people who have this very radically different sense of themselves um, than people who are not transgender. Um, we have be be begun to be very welcoming and um, loving, in fact, um, in accepting uh, the humanity gay men and lesbians, and in fact, all kinds of people who we think of as being, um, uh, well, in the minority. We saw this last week, the 
uh, 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, and I know many of us had um, our breath taken away as we um, thought about all the progress that we've made in this country. For trans people, um, that progress is a long way off. Because why? Because there are so few of us, for one thing, and because um, I think straight people are now beginning to sit, to understand gay and lesbians because we can say, well, I know what it's like to love someone. So um, if you're gay, then it must be that you love someone, but you love someone different. But I can imagine what it's like to love someone. That's like my experience. If you're trans, it means your experience of being in your body is really fundamentally different from that of someone who is not trans. And that takes a lot more imagination. Right? So um, there's a lot of progress we made. Anyway, uh, uh, <coughs> I said, what did I say when the big hand was on the nine? Let's keep going. So, <laughs> so one, one way of being transgender is to be a transsexual. That is someone like me. And those are the people who you associate with someone who changes sex physically, if you're lucky through the intervention of the medical community, through hormones, through um, psychologists, through surgeons, through nice <coughs> works at the large size shoe store. Look at her feet, wow. That's why I have this podium. <laughs> okay, that's one, that's one way of being transgender. Another way of being transgender is a drag queen or there are drag kings, of course, as well. But when you see someone like RuPaul on TV, or I don't know, some a female, so-called female impersonator, um, a drag queen, uh, someone who uh, puts on this amazing illusion of being usually female, but sometimes female also, right? A drag queen is not a transsexual. Still with me? In other words, a drag queen usually, and again, these categories are not clear and separate, but usually, a drag queen is a gay man. So if you're a gay man, you may have the ability to be a really fabulous Liza Minnelli or Judy Garland. But if you're, I'm about to say the word penis, so if you don't want to hear that, cover your ears. <laughs> if you're a gay man, um, your penis is something that is a source of pleasure to you. And even though you can put on this theatrical sense of yourself as female, Getting a vagina is not necessarily on your to-do list. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 making, I'm making a joke out of this, but it's a very important distinction. So if you see some, a, a beautiful woman who is physically, you know to be physically male, like RuPaul on TV, that's not a transsexual. That's not someone like me. Still with me? Another kind of being transgender is a crossdresser. A, um, and a crossdresser is usually a straight man who dresses as a woman uh, for, well, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, one reason is it's fun. Another reason is it can be relaxing, it can be part of, it can be part of a, uh, a, a fantasy life, a fantasy experience. Um, sometimes there's a sexual component to that. But a crossdresser does not necessarily want to become a woman. And a crossdresser, usually straight, usually married, usually does it in secret because he feels that people will laugh at him or be creeped out by him. Um, that person is not a drag queen, is not a gay man. Still with me? All right. Then there's a, a one last kind of being uh, transgender, so-called genderqueer people. That's one word, genderqueer. Um, I often see this among young people, um, and these are often people who just want to reject the idea of a gender binary um, at all. People who want to embrace a kind of fluid, androgynous, um, sometimes genderless existence, and sometimes this is connected to a political um, identity as well. If you're in the presence of someone who says, reject the gender binary, uh, you're probably in the presence of, the, of a gender queer person. Okay, that's four different ways of being transgender, and if you can think about it, those four different ways of being gender variant are really different from each other, right? So, this is why trans issues are so frustrating and so hard for 
well, for, 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 for many of you, for our people who wish to be our allies, who wish to help us, because there's not any one way of being gender variant. And um, in fact, the multiplicity of ways of um, experiencing gender and performing gender can be so different that um, uh, people can kind of fight over what it is we're talking about in the first place. So what can you do? If you, if you know someone who is, who is uh, going through this or who's experiencing this, well, one thing you can do is learn all you can. You, you don't buy all my books. <laughs> but more pragmatically, just open your heart. Just be loving and kind. The same way you would be to anybody whose experience and whose way of being human is different from yours. Um, and then it's not really about opening your heart to transgender people. It's about opening your heart to anyone who, uh, whose experience of the world uh, is different from your own. You know, you spend most of your life with people who are not you. At least, that's been my experience. Okay. Uh, and people who are not me say these things that I would never have come up with. They've known and seen things that I can't imagine. So what can you do but ask people questions? Listen, ask them to tell you their stories. Um, the same way you would to anyone uh, whose um, humanity you want to learn about, whose experience of life you want to embrace. Because um, that makes us larger people as well, right? It lifts, it lifts up our own souls. Um, the more stories that we know, the more of humanity we understand, the bigger our hearts are, and the more compassion we can have. And how could anybody be against that? All right, we've got uh, now about Let's, let's call it three minutes for questions. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. What's Oprah really like? <laughs> um, what the question was, for, lo for, those our, for those of our viewers at home, the question was, what's Oprah really like? Um, I had a mixed experience on Oprah. Um, so on the one hand, uh, um, she was skeptical. Um, she was... Um, um, suspicious and wary, the way people in the press often are. Um, there's a way in which you can treat people who are transgender on TV that you would never treat um, anyone else. It's perfectly okay to have um, prejudice and um, suspicion of trans people as if, some, as if we're up to something, as if we're really just crazy. Well, and maybe people can believe that. They want to believe that. That's fine. But I, I can't open their hearts if, I, if they just think I'm crazy. So um, she, sa she said I was selfish. Um, she, uh, um, she kept me on a very short leash. Um, she, um, she wouldn't let me be funny. She would hardly let me get a word in edgewise, which you can imagine how I felt about that. <laughs> on the other hand, it was her show. <laughs> so I felt a little bit like um, I, I, was, I, was, I was kept in a very small box, so I was, I was restless with that. On the other hand, made my book a bestseller in one day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's something called an Amazon ranking. You know, because it's that on Amazon they take every book that's sold that they sell in the country. They don't they don't split it into you know, fiction book. It's just you know uh, you know uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey is number one and how to build your own block of wood is number you know, three million. <laughs> so on the day, on, on the morning I was on Oprah, I was on uh, the book was number um, four hundred thousand, and that afternoon it was number eleven. <laughs> um, um, authors and not just me. At this point, being an author is such a desperate business. Um, to, well, you can't just be J. Well, I don't know if it's even possible to be J.D. Salinger anymore and just say, I don't care. You know, I'm just going to lock the door. People want to buy my books, fine. I mean, it helps if you've written Catch on the Right before, <laughs> <laughs> before getting up on a movie. But um, to be an author means you, you, you've got to um, work the room constantly. Um, and um, for me, it's sometimes um, discouraging. I mean, some of the things, I mean, you know, the, some of the shows I've had to be on. You know, one time I was on, I forget what the name of it, but it was something like, you know, Benito and Adolf's Morning Drive. <laughs> you know, and, and, 
and when they just made fun of me, you know, and uh, uh, well, I can take care of myself. But um, um, this is, it, it's part of, um, to be an author now means not only to write the book, it means you have to talk about the book. And many of us are not designed to talk about our work. Many of us become authors in the first place because we can do it, you know, in our own room. Our own room. <laughs> you know, uh, authors are not necessarily gregarious public people. I mean, I am because I've, I've spent a lifetime in the classroom and I have, you know, 25 years at Colby College um, uh, to, my, to my record, which, oh, thank God, right? 25 years this summer, this August, I, I, I arrived in uh, Fairfield, Maine. Um, uh, to begin what I thought was a one-year job. I thought, well, Maine, I'll go there for a year and get the hell out of there. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was after, after um, a after getting married, it was, luck it was the second luckiest thing that happened, happened to me in my life. Uh, let's see, another, another question? Oh, so many questions. Do you want to go past quarter of? Yeah. Yes. Are you sure? Yeah. Yes. You know, uh, I can take a break. I'll take a break in quarter of, and if you've got to go, or if it's just you don't want to sit in these chairs any more than 45 minutes, which I understand. I wouldn't want to listen to me this long. If you have to go, you have to go. So we'll take a little break then, but I'll, I'll, I'll stay here till noon if you want. Oh my God, she said noon. Ah. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, I'll go right here. Um, I'm as out as I want to be, which supports lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, gender, and question. Area. So we cover this area. We have. Uh, what is your name? Jean Dooley. I'm the executive director. Hi, Jean. Thank you for all you do. Well, thank you for coming and speaking because I think this I'm is. I'm thanking so, Jean so Dooley. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, a very complicated question because, um, uh, and, and, and again, I'm an English teacher and a storyteller. I'm not a therapist or even um, um, a scientist. Um, so uh, I, I know a lot about this topic, but, uh, but in terms, particularly in terms of counseling transgender youth, um, uh, as Walter White would say, tread lightly. Um, yeah, if, if there was someone under 20 in this room, they'd know a Breaking Bad reference. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll just keep going. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm not in that group either. So. <laughs> um, well, uh, and I hate to give this advice because people hate my advice, right? My advice as a teacher and a parent, do your homework. Um, the, being transgender is hard in this country, in, in all countries. It's, it's not as hard as it was in the 70s when I was growing up, but it's still difficult. Um, you probably don't need to tell young people that to come out as trans, which, uh, you know, or gay or anything else, means, means that you're going to be swimming upstream for a lot of your life. So how can we help people who are going to be um, uh, occasionally, and sometimes frequently, marginalized by the culture? Education, knowledge, wisdom, um, those, because this is America, the great equalizer is education. Um, so um, if you want to, you, uh, some of you may be old enough to remember Bob Dylan. <laughs> Dylan says, to, to, to live outside the law, you must be honest. <laughs> right? That's the God's honest truth. Um, if you're going to break the rules of this of the culture, or seem to break the rules, uh, you have to do so um, not only from a position of honesty, but from a position of knowledge. So, both you can encourage the young person to do this, and you can do this yourself. Read everything. So, starting of course with my books, and then <laughs> and then um, books by other good, they're good transgender writers and other writers about gender. I love the work of Deborah Rudsill. I love the work of um, Jameson Green. Um, and uh, Helen Boyd, 
There's a very, very complicated academic named Susan Stryker. That's with a Y. Um, anyway, I can, I can get to tell you resources of people to read. Um, tell your young people to do as well as they possibly can in school. Take the AP classes. Get into college. Get into a good college. Um, attain the skills that you will need to be gainfully employed and to support yourself in this, in this um, country. Become uh, an electrical engineer, <laughs> or, or, or whatever, you, whatever, you, whatever your passion tells you that will help you support yourself. Um, because um, you will, because to be trans can mean medical bills. It can mean um, uh, uh, a lot of, of costs, lots of things that are not covered by insurance. Um, and um, above all, it may call for you to be articulate about your experience of being human that other people may not understand. So you've got to learn how to open up your mouth and talk. So those are, I don't know if that's, if, I mean, if those are obvious things. It's, it's the same thing I would tell anyone who um, is trying to do something impossible in this culture. Get your education. Do your homework. You can see how, and I, I have spoken in high schools and middle schools, in fact, and you can imagine how popular this advice is. Because people want, want me to say, you know, be yourself and embrace the dream and start the gender revolution, which of course is all true. I believe all that. But first, do your homework. What else can I do? Uh, I'll go to the left side of the room. Anybody up front? Okay, right here in part. I'm wondering how your sons accepted things. And they were young. When, they were. Yeah. And have they. Can they share your story openly with friends, or were they able to? The, the question is, how are my sons? And um, I'm going to read a piece. In fact, I'll read, by way of answer, I'll read a piece now, a uh, short piece um, that will be kind of maybe end of part one this morning, um, involving the story of my sons. I will say uh, that um, nothing bad has ever happened to my sons as a result of having me as a parent, ever. They were never teased in school. They were never bullied. Nothing. Really? You think somebody would have beaten them up just once? Well, so why is that? Well, uh, I can think of a couple reasons for why why things were okay. Um, one of which may have been sheer luck. Let's acknowledge it. because I oh my God the stories I hear every day of the experience of trans people around this country and their children. Um, and gay, and gay children, and gay parents. I mean, turn on, turn on the news any day, and you'll see the story of someone else who... Uh, I saw a story last month of um, a man who was beaten up on Christopher Street in Greenwich, in Greenwich Village in New York City for being gay. Yeah. It's not Larry. So, um, you, so uh, you can be... Um, to be different in this culture means to be... Um, uh, can, can mean to be engaged. So maybe, first off, we're protected by life. Secondly, though, if we had anything to do with it, um, for one thing, for one thing, we live in the state of Maine. Now, Maine is not exactly Northampton, Massachusetts, or Key West. Um, but Mainers respect each other's privacy. There is a what did Mark Twain say? Two people can keep a secret, but one of them is dead. <laughs> so um, there's a way in which I was protected by being so so out and so open. Um, I'll read this little short piece from the end of the new book. Um, if I can get this device to work. Um, and uh, this really is uh, just a short little thing, and it's the very last piece in the book. Um, Oh, I'll tell you one more story about my kids. Um, as a measure of how cool the kids were with it, mine came out when they were very, very little. They were maybe, I guess, one and three, maybe when, when I first started coming out, trying to come out. Um, so there's one day when my, my oldest son, Zach, went in around five or six, and he looked at me at the dinner table with this curious look, and I said, what? And he said, we can't keep calling you dad if you're going to be a girl. That's too weird. So I said, well, you could call me Jenny. You know, that's my name now. And he said, isn't Jenny the name of a lady donkey? <laughs> <laughs> Trying not to be hurt.
heard, I said, well, what, what do you want to call me? And it took him about three seconds to say, um, well, we could call you Maddie. Well, Maddie's, and that could be like, that's like half mommy, half daddy. Plus, I know a girl's full name, Maddie, and she's nice. <laughs> and then his little brother said, or, or, or Dommy. <laughs> They're now, of course, uh, Zach is about to be a sophomore at Vassar College, and Shawnee is about to begin his senior year at uh, Kansas Hill School. Um, but, you know, they still call me Maddie, and, and their friends call me Maddie, too. It's really lovely, you know. If, you, if, you've, if you've ever been the parent of teenagers, there's a certain, well, you know, some of mine and my teenagers, when there's an energy when the doors burst open, especially like this vacation, they're all back from wherever they go, and suddenly, suddenly the house is full, all those young voices, and you're just like, five, ten teenagers, and they're running around, and it's like nematodes. They just go right through the kitchen. <laughs> anything that could be edible. Refrigerators are with, like, like, they cross the refrigerator as they move through. <laughs> I just love seeing all that energy, and they all come in. Hi, Maddie. Hi, Maddie. Um, so here's the story. And, and this book, is, this uh, story is called Anti-Venom. We were driving up a dirt road together, Zach and I, fighting about this essay he'd written for school, where I'm going to be 10 years from now. His prediction? Australia, developing anti-venom for the Australian death adder. <laughs> I offered my opinion. No. <laughs> <laughs> you should be proud, he said. He was 18 now. Me, getting a PhD in toxicology, helping to save lives. You're not handling poisonous snakes for all of you, okay? You're just not. It's my life. I know it's your life, but if you're dead, it's my life. Plunged into darkness. I'm not going to die. Of course you're going to die. Australia has the deadliest snakes in the world. We were driving toward the cabin of his former fiddle teacher. She was having a party. My son cast a glance at me. You should believe in me. He said, of course I believe in you, I just don't want you to get hurt. I'm not going to get hurt. You're going to handle deadly snakes, how can you possibly not get hurt? You pick them up with a long stick. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, a long stick, that, now my mind is at ease. <laughs> he shook his head, he was irritated. You don't believe I can milk the venom from snakes. Zach, you failed your driver's license test three times. You've lost every pair of glasses you've ever owned. Of course you're going to get bitten by a poisonous snake and die. And then my life will be plunged into darkness. They have anti-venom for the death adder. He explained, if there's any trouble, I'll just take the anti-venom. Okay. If they already have the anti-venom, why would you have to handle the snakes in the first place? I was getting angry now. I thought developing the anti-venom was the whole point. Why would you handle the snakes if you already have anti-venom for the... You're shouting. <laughs> of course I'm shouting. I said, this is why I changed all those diapers. This is what I gave my life to. You, dead in Australia, poison, alone. He just shook his head. In lieu of conversation, he turned on his iPod, which was wired to the car stereo. The car filled with blarney, the pipes and the fiddles and all the rest. I guess his, his theory was, a little music from the old country might song. <laughs> he was wrong. <laughs> then, something ran across the road before us. Zach jammed on the brakes. It all happened very quickly. One minute we were listening to Irish music, the next we were spinning through space, waiting to see if we would live. We skidded into the ditch. From the woods, a coyote paused and looked back at us. I saw the wildness in his eyes. That was good driving, I said. <laughs> Zach, excellent reactions. Zach started the car again, got us out of the ditch. We started up the hill again. I told you that you could trust me, he said. A few months before this, he'd been admitted to Vassar College for early decision. 
I love telling people my son was going to be a Vassar man. <laughs> <laughs> My other son was in South Africa. He'd been accepted as an exchange student for the last third of his sophomore year at a school in Cape Town. A month earlier, we'd taken him to Logan Airport and loaded the 15-year-old on the plane. Please be careful, we'd said. He gave us a sly grin. I got it, he said, then walked off toward Africa without his mother's. What did he do in South Africa by way of being careful? He went bungee jumping and skydiving and rock climbing and shark cage diving. <laughs> now the sun was sinking toward the ridge to my right. The long, shining mirror of Long Pond was visible in the valley. Silence hung in the air between us, and not for the first time. My sons were leaving me, going out into the broad world. Zach, I said at last, if you really, really want to milk the poison from deadly snakes in Australia. If that's your dream, I'll support you. Thank you, he said, and rubbed my shoulder. This means a lot to me. I'll always support you and your dreams, I said, even if your dreams are stupid. <laughs> Tears rolled down. Of course, if it was the stupidity of dreams we were considering, I was one to talk. I mean, please. I thought of the hours I'd spent at Zach's age, lying in bed, staring at the ceiling, imagining a world a whole lot farther away than Australia. We pulled up at his violin teacher's house right at the top of Buttermilk Hill in Belgrade. The pastures of her farm were all around us, and beyond that, the mountains and the lakes. Her husband's single-engine plane sat at the edge of a long field. A windsock dangled from a pole just beyond the field of tomatoes and cabbages. From the cabin came the sound of scurling mandolins and fiddles. My son looked at me, incredulous. You're crying now, he said, about me getting bitten by an imaginary snake in Australia. In the future, you're actually crying. <laughs> I wiped the tears away and we got out of the car. The sun was almost gone now, sinking behind the mountains. We walked toward the cabin. The music grew louder. His teacher was playing a reel, a farewell to Aaron. In the twilight, it was hard for me to see the stairs. I paused at the bottom step, unsteady on my old legs, uncertain. My son turned to me and took me by the arm. Come on, Maddie, Zach said. I've got you. Thank you. And then the new one is called Stuck in the Middle with You, um, about the differences between motherhood and fatherhood. Um, so um, I'll go over there. I'll thank you all for coming again. And I'll just say um, what, a, what a great pleasure it is to speak with you and um, encourage you to, uh, well, just not to encourage you, just to wish you good luck um, with uh, every adventure that comes your way. Um, I always think, you know, um, you know, if I can do this, you know, you guys can do anything. <laughs>